Hello and welcome to this session with Dan Rouse. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dan to you all today. She's an ornithologist, she's an author, she's a wildlife presenter and a wildlife guide, so ticks quite a lot of boxes, has quite a fascinating day to day, I can imagine. And she's a, our, our resident June expert in birds and all things birding. So, um, Dan, I'm going to hand over to you. It's always a bit weird not seeing people, but my name's Dan. Um, I do a lot of different things, but majority of my time I'm spent on the coast. So I'm either on sand um, on the coast or I'm either in dunes. So a lot of the time I'm fully accustomed to having sand everywhere. Um, and today we're just going to be talking about different birds and their relationships with dunes and how to identify some species as well. So I'm sure many of you have been going through different dune systems different coastal paths and things like that. So hopefully I can give you a bit of an insight into how to identify these different species. So why are dune systems important? So dune systems are great for plant species. So obviously when we're thinking about food chains, we have the lower down things like plants, which in turn feed invertebrates, bees, butterflies, moths, which in turn feed our birds. So, of course, having these areas for plants is vitally important to different ecosystems. So they're also great for nesting insects as well. So we have here uh, shrill carder bees that nest in one of our dune systems. So obviously, as I was saying, a um, variety of different insects nest there, they feed, and we have a lot of different varieties in dune systems as well, from bees to beetles. Uh, there's also spiders as well that use dune plants. So these, again, will feed, uh, feed our birds. They're also dense habitats, so sand may not be considered a habitat to most people, but sand is greatly important to these other things, but also dunes are home to scrubs, they're also home to areas of wildflowers, orchids, that kind of thing. And most of them do have some tree species as well, like willow, gorse, that kind of thing. So it is a lot of varied habitats as well. So there's different feeding opportunities. So whilst normally um, birds of feed from perches. Nesting and feeding is very different in dune systems. You have mainly specialist ones. So they're either looking for easy prey, like your meadow pipits would just nip down, grab something off of the plant, and then head back to the nest. Or you'd have things like kestrels, which are looking in the habitats for small voles, mice species, and they'll be flying down to grab them that way. So it's a nice easy way to see the different varied habitats and different feeding ways of different birds. So I'll go into these in a bit more depth when we get onto the individual species. But different birds have different ways of feeding and these dunes can really replicate what they do elsewhere. So dunes are really good feeding areas for different species. And of course, dunes are constantly evolving and constantly changing. So whilst we'd think a dune is settled and that's what it's going to be, we see that over the years they change in different ways. There's more grassy areas, sometimes there's less grassy areas, more trees arrive over time. Um, whilst that's not particularly great for the dunes um, sort of build up and how they're built, the, do, the trees do provide a different source of habitat and food. So year on year, we're seeing different things arrive in dunes and we're also seeing different things leaving. Some species then become specialist to dunes. Other ones take up the opportunity to nest there as well. So why are dunes important? Sort of further, they're specialized for harsh environments. On the coast here, I live on the Gower. Um, we see a lot of storms. <laughs> so whilst our sea is lovely and it looks picturesque. Sometimes we get tides of 14 to, 4, uh, to 15 meters and our dunes and our coasts do take a battering. So dunes here, um, just the name of few, we have Kenfig, which I'm sure many of you know for fen orchids. So this again is sort of explaining why dunes are important because some of them have species that are either endemic to the area or 
they're easier to see at that area. So shrill cardio bees are very, very selective. We see them at Kenfig. Kenfig also has fen orchids as well, which is the last location in Wales and the last but one location in the UK for the species. So again, dunes are really specialist, great habitats, and because they're forever changing, you don't really know how that wildlife is coping. But in terms of birds, um, there isn't many birds that are specialist to dunes, but they're very much opportunistic and they will use dunes to their advantage when you're looking at the plants and insects that change over time there. So of course, there are sea defences as well. Dunes can take a pretty hefty battering before they become just piles of sand. So they are very, very important to us as humans as well. They do protect our land, protect houses. The ones just thinking of Kenfig, for example, you have the sea, then you have the dunes, and then you have a pool, and then you have a whole village of houses. So without those dunes, then the village is on the same level as the sea. So, of course, they're very, very well, large. The area that dunes cover isn't necessarily you have a little bump of sand before the coast. Some could be like that. But if you think about dunes in terms of a habitat and a structure, they're huge. So they vary in size. Some of them are tall things that you have to scale upwards. Other ones are like little ridges, but these provide great habitats for small species of birds as well because you're cutting off that line of sight. So without seeing the coast, larger, more opportunistic birds like gulls and things have to individually fly over each of the dunes before looking for food because you can't see between a lot of them. So if you're having small species of birds with their young, like stone chats who have three to four young, these dunes provide great sort of caves and alcoves where they can hide under and it also gives them prior warning of watching something emerge before they've had a chance to scan the area as well. So apologies, this is a little bit grainy, but you can see here the different styles of dunes. So at the base, you have the beach, and then you have this first layer of dune, our first defence. So this first one normally is a shelter. So it's normally where you find your reptiles. And you'll also find more coastal birds using it for shelter. So waders, oyster catchers, curlew, golden plover, gray plover, they'll use these first embryonic dunes, the first ones. This is just to use it as a wind shelter, depending on where the wind's coming from. But also, it's also a good area to look for those really dense, tidal things that get washed up and caught on the dune. So if you're looking for food, then your first dune slack will host a lot of different food. Our first stable dune is the one that doesn't change very often. This normally changes after a few years. Instead of the first one can vary in size depending on how strong the tide is. The first stable dune is one that has taken years to create and will take years to change and restructure. So it's this first dune and the dune slack behind it where a lot of our birds actually nest. So things like uh, meadow pipits, they'll be the ones that will nest in these short areas, skylark as well. They prefer dune slacks, they prefer to be at the base of dunes where they have lots of habitat to hide in. So our second stable dune isn't that different to the first. Normally they're taller, but it's that slight slack between the older dune systems and the second stable one is where you find more of your specialist species because this is where your trees and your dense habitat will be coming from, like your gorse. So having these older dunes is great for larger tree species, willow, uh, we get a lot of hawthorn, things like that. But that's where you find like your white throat, your stone chats breeding, where you'd also find um, birds using it during peak migration points. They've had a long distance of flight. They'll be using these older dunes as a resting space as well. So these are just some of the dunes that we have around Wales. So taking it out of context of birds on a whole, 
these are just some of the ones we have here just to explain a bit more about them because a lot of our dune systems in Wales vary in habitat but also vary in the species that use them so for example kenfig on the top left kenfig is very good for rare birds so we've had um, the first record ever in the western Palearctic for little wimbrel in the kenfig dune slacks neither of the other dunes or any well there's been one other record in the uk but look at other dune systems that use the kenfig dunes we have breeding meadow pipits, breeding skylark, stone chats, white throats, lesser white throats. Um, these dunes are also home to <clears throat> different species of wader, golden plover, use them quite frequently. But then if you just scale right slightly to Dovey, Dovey's mid Wales, so Kenfig's in the south in Glamorgan, Dovey's mid Wales. And that is completely different because of the coastal slack and the dune slack is right on the coast. We get more things like ospreys using it to hunt, merlins using it to hunt as well, hen harriers using it during the winter time. Because it's such a very overgrown grass, sort of loads of junkers and rushes, it's this dune slack is perfect for hunting birds of prey. So dovey are likely to see more birds of prey than kenfig. Kenfig you'll get kestrels, but that's about it. It's mainly the little birds and the waders that rely on kenfig. Whereas if you look down at Gronant, Gronant's dune system is completely different to the other three in that it's a very, very flat dune system. Instead of having these large dune slacks, they've got almost duned ridges. And these ridges are perfect for things like shorelarks, uh, snow buntings. It's very important area for our seabirds. A lot of terns use this for nesting, ringed plover, oyster catchers also use this dunes for nesting. So Mirtha Maur, this one is directly opposite Kenfig. So Kenfig's on the coast, Mirtha Maur is behind it. Mirtha Maur is different in that we get pied flycatchers on there during autumn and spring. There's also night jaws that start cheering from there. Um, he's a bit lost, but he thrives. <laughs> we get a lot of buntings as well. So there's hundreds of linnets, goldfinches, um, there's also reed buntings that use it as well. So whilst these dunes look very similar and the terminology dune is applying to them, all four of them, because of the change in their habitat and where they are in the country, the birds that use them vary completely between the four. So just looking at the, the ones in a bit more depth, we have the famous faces of our dunes. So whilst I was mentioning with these dunes that each one of them has different birds, there's a lot of different wildlife that is very dependent on them. So just exploring them further, we have little terns. We only have one colony here in Wales and that is on one of our dunes. So that's the Gronant one up North Wales. Uh, if you've ever been to North Wales, Gronant is almost near Anglesey. Um, it's very, very lovely dune system and it's a very pretty area to visit as well. So it's the only colony in Wales. It, little terns are the smallest turn species that we get in the UK. So their Latin name actually translates to white faced turn. So if I just pop these backwards a little bit, you can just see that little white forehead on the turns. So they are very, very tiny. They screech and they squawk. Um, they're very, very small. So we there are species that are smaller than it, but the ones we get in the UK, yeah, little turn is quite literally a little turn and it is the smallest. It's yellow beak as a dead giveaway. So if you're looking at other species that would use gronant and Kemlin dune systems. You have common terns, you also have Arctic terns, and you also have sandwich terns. So you've got two red beaks, which are your common and your Arctic. So then you have a black beak for sandwich turn, and then you have lovely yellow beaks for little terns. 
So Groenland can be very confusing, especially during the breeding time where everybody seems to breed there. But this just shows how good this dune slack is. Whilst it's a beach, for the most part, as the dunes start to come up, this offers a lot of protection for the birds. It's the same as Spurn, if anyone's been to Spurn. That's a very short dune system. So it does provide a lot of stable and embryonic dunes in that they change, but also we have the stabilized ones that offer a lot of protection. The little terns prefer that habitat for nesting in compared to like open flat beaches where they're a bit more exposed. So Groenland is great in that regard because of the dunes that are forever changing, but also offers a lot of shelter and protection. And it also gives you that prior warning of birds of prey and aerial predators as well. So more on our little tins, adults weigh around 50 grams, which is the same as a golf ball. Basically a lot of birds, they're all fluff. If you see bird skeletons, there's not much to them at all. It's mainly a lot of it is nice fluffy enough around them, lots of feathers, keeps them nice and warm. And because these are seabirds as well, they spend a lot of time out at sea. So most of their weight is feather based. So to see little terns, they arrive in April and they'll stay until about September time where the adults will leave first, followed by the juveniles later on then. So they nest on sandy or shingle beaches. Whilst this isn't necessarily a dune, because of these dunes, like I was saying, it offers that protection to them and it keeps them nice and secure while they're um, breeding. So the Gronant terns, um, they, they've been doing good. They've been doing really, really well. Um, we're now looking at ringing them. So I'm not necessarily involved with a lot of the stuff up there, but a lot of my friends have worked on the preserve and worked on um, monitoring them. So they still increase in numbers. Every year they're seeing more little terns arriving and more using the area to breed. And because they are a colonizing bird, once they start to do well, more and more arrive. So they don't reach maturity for about two to three years. And after that, then they'll look for locations to nest in. Because there's only about six or seven colonies of little terns around the UK, there's not much choice in areas to nest. So we see a lot of them are boosting these colonies. So Spurn, Gronant, uh, there's one, what's the other one? Spurn, Gronan. There's about one in Norfolk and one down south in Dorset as well. Um, because we're seeing more and more little terns hatching and we're working out best predator protection as well. So using nests as decoys, using um, turn little huts, they're almost like rabbit hutches. And then also using electric fences to keep them sane from ground predators like foxes and otters as well. We're seeing the colonies grow, which is absolutely amazing for these birds, considering we are at a stage where they can either be lost in the UK or they can thrive in the UK. So they are doing really, really well. So my favorite doom system bird is oyster catchers. I'm not biased, but I am from the Gower where we see quite a lot of them. <laughs> So this is Whitford. Um, Whitford Dunes is amazing. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult habitat to get through. So those of you who have been on dune systems, some of them are lovely that you have a nice little trek through them, particularly the ones that are manicured so that you can walk through them. Whitford's wild. So you either strap on your walking boots and get on with it, or you'll be forever trying to walk around it. It's very bumpy. There's lots of ridges. The sand moves as you try to climb on it. So it's quite the dune system, which is why it's so good for birds because there's so much of it. The dunes are very loose as well. So it provides so much habitat for smaller species of birds. Um, it's probably the only place maybe on the Gower you reliably see snow buntings during the winter. So it's a lovely area, but anyway, back to oyster catchers. 
it's the sixth most important site in the UK for oyster catchers. So whilst oyster catchers, you can see them in large numbers almost anywhere, Whitford, the roosting flock there is very, very impressive. Um, I recently filled, filmed a piece for Country File where we filmed about 8,000 oyster catchers using this dune system to roost in. So February, we'll see maybe 15 to 20,000 oyster catchers there. If you don't know what that looks like, just imagine an ant's nest. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. They are quite literally everywhere. Every piece of sand you look on, there's oyster catchers. The noise is absolutely deafening as well. And it's just a fantastic location. It makes you really appreciate what a stretch of sand that's been molded and created in such a way can give to something like an oyster catcher. So we tag them every October, we'll bring the oyster catchers and also look for retraps. Um, I'll lay on the dunes during the winter months just with the scope and binoculars and we'll try and recite some of them. So we've had some from Sweden, Iceland, Norway. We've had quite a few that have bred in Scotland. So they've been ringed on the nest in Scotland. And then I've read them from the Gower. So it's great seeing that there's so many individuals that have come from different countries that are now um, using the Gower and using our dunes as a roosting spot as well. So it's not just oyster catchers that use the dunes at Whitford. We have other waders as well. So there's about 6,000 Dunlin, maybe 100 or so ringed plover, 3,000 golden plover, 3,000 red shank. It's also a nationally important site for shell duck as well. Um, whilst we don't necessarily see them in the dunes, we do get a few pairs that nest in the dune systems every year as well. So not only is this dune system great for the plants as well, and we're seeing lots of rare plants there, for birds, particularly waders, this dune system is completely their safe haven. If there wasn't for this dune system and for the dunes that have been created, these waders wouldn't have anywhere else to go because they're on an estuary. So this is a nice safe haven for them. So going into birds a bit more, I've showed you two that are particularly great for dunes, but moving away from whales a little bit and helping you guys to identify the different species. Um, I have a few birds that you're likely to see on dune systems and of course to give you some tools in identifying them as well. So I'm sure many of you know what this is. These are stone chats. They're lovely, lovely little birds. So on the on the left is the male, so you can see the bright orange breast, the black head and the white collar. So they are called the vicar bird. And they're really smart looking birds, very easy to spot in dunes as well. Most of the time they'll be sitting on the very, very tops of gorse. They'll be sitting um, looking for food because they are part of the chats, the robin and chats family. They're like flies. So you'll see them often fly catching, jumping down from their perch onto the ground, grabbing some food, and jumping back to the perch. They normally use brambles, gorse, fence posts as well, and that's their lookout spot. So you can see the female is on the left. They look very, very brown and drab in comparison to the males, but the easy way to spot a stone trapped from any other bird is to look for the white collars and to also look for the white stripes on the tail because that's probably the easiest way but also the behavior watching them just flick down to the ground to pick up some food and fly back up that's very characteristic of stone chats as well so their name in welsh is clockoin a kerig which is the stone knocker in english it's stone chat because their noise is that of two stones knocking together. So English calls them stone chats because their chat is like knocking stones. In Welsh, they're called knockers a kerig, which is just stone knocker because that's just what they sound like. So they're very easy to spot. Again, nice little birds, very easy. 
and you probably see them around the whole of the UK on dunes. So it's a nice one to look out for. These, I'm sure everybody knows what these are because they're in the in the media so much. These are hen harriers. So we have the female on the right and we have a male on the left. Whilst the males are very, very beautiful to look at, they're very hard to spot, I find. <laughs> they're not that bold. So the ones we see around here, normally it's only the winter because they're upland breeding species. They'll disappear up to the northern areas, dense habitats on moors to breed. But during the winter, they use dune systems as an opportunity for hunting because they're full of things like rabbits, they're full of lizards, they're full of voles, mice, shrews, things like that. The harriers will take their chance and nab a quick bite as they're going past, particularly juveniles or they get classified as ring-tailed because juveniles are very, very similar to females. They have a white ring and a brown ring around their tails, which is why they get the name ring-tailed. And that basically means a female or a juvenile. Um, you can pretty much guess when it would be, but they start molting um, during their second year. So you'll know whether you have a female or male second year. But of course, who's going to know that unless you actually have a ringed bird? But anyway, the male is very easy. Lovely grey colour, white underneath and the black on the primaries. We do have um, another species that can be confusing with them, which is our Montague's Harrier. But of course, they're very rare in the UK. There's maybe only two of them around. Um, so you don't see them very often. We mainly see hen harriers using dune systems to um, hunt birds and grab food. That Sorry, I got the hiccups today. <laughs> we will see them for grabbing food that way. So, like I was saying, nice birds to see. Um, I wouldn't say they're too difficult to spot. Um, mainly November, December time you'll see them. And that is because they're off the nest. Obviously, the juveniles then have to fend for themselves. The females are also trying to gain back a lot of food waste that they've... So, whilst they're breeding, the male will hunt while the female looks after the young. So the male normally keeps his body weight fairly similar. The females lose a bit of body weight because they're not hunting as much. But the juveniles, they get accustomed to a certain lifestyle. So they like to pile on the pounds, shall we say. And once they're hunting, they then have to learn to hunt for themselves. And once they're learning to hunt for themselves, they take a lot of opportunities that become available to them. So dune systems are a good one, particularly as areas like South Wales. We have a lot of dunes in a lot of areas, so it's a great area for them to spot. Who do we have next? Oh, it's a very blurry photo, but this is a merlin. Merlins are another species that they're pretty much here all year round, but they're quite difficult to spot because they can get confused with things like um, kestrels. So Merlin's the smallest bird of prey that we have in the UK, um, if you discount Little Owl. But Merlin's are tiny falcons. Of course, they do hunt like a falcon as well. So whilst kestrels do their hovering, Merlin's instead use observation perches, much like a buzzard. So they'll sit down on the fence post, they'll survey the area, and then they'll come in for the attack. So instead of taking um, large species of mouse, rat, that kind of thing, they'll go for smaller species like voles, shrews. They'll also go for chicks as well. So if there's any stragglers who haven't gained as much weight as the others, like stone chat babies, Merlins will take the chance and take them as well. So they're very, very spotty. So you can see just on this individual here, just how much of these windows are on its wings. So you can see it that way. Also the streaky belly is quite a giveaway for Merlins as well. What do we have next? We have a meadow pipit. So meadow pipits, um, they can be a bit confusing. I know lots of people struggle with their pipits. 
Um, basically, if they're bright, bright yellow, you have a meadow pipit. So, and also meadow pipits are a bit of a giveaway in that the rock pipits like rocks, and then you have things like um, water pipits and other rare pipits. But meadow pipits here have this lovely spotted look to their breast. So on the front breast area, you can see the spots continue from the throat down towards the flanks, which is the part at the sides of them. So not the belly, the sides. Down onto their flanks, nice clean bellies. And also you can see the fringing on these carpals as well. So on these greater coverts above the wings, you can see the lovely little fringes on them. But again, the easiest way is also to listen out for them. Meadow pipits have got a very high pitched sort of shrill noise. They do the same as Skylark in their aerial defense. So they're a bit difficult, uh, difficult to spot that way, but that's where the call comes into it. So the meadow pipit call is a very sort of high pitched one after another noise. So they're quite easy to spot that way. And of course, if you're near a nest, they'll do their aerial display, which is a dead giveaway. <laughs> It's supposed to be to frighten off predators, but to me, they just let you know where they're nesting because you'll start walking, meadow pipit goes up, starts aerial display, and you know you're within a couple of feet of a nest. So that's my cue to walk away and get up away. Um, there's not much else to say about meadow pipits. They're just lovely little yellow birds. You see them almost anywhere. So they're quite difficult in behavior because they do behave like a pipit where they walk across the grass, they'll walk across the dunes on their own. But sometimes they do act like um, other passerines and they'll sit on top of trees and they'll also sit. Um, oh, we have a question. I'll just pop that in. Um, I'll answer questions at the end if that's all right, because I get on my, I get in my stride. Um, but basically, meadow pipits, um, they can act differently. So they can sit on top of trees where it's a bit bizarre to see them, but the call is very sort of characteristic of them. So it's a good way to listen out for um, meadow pipits. It's just getting to know the alarm call and getting to know that high pitched shrill that they do as well. Who do we have here? We have a linnet. So linnets are really pretty, really smart birds. This is a male. So you can see with it, it has the brown back, it has the stripy black and white wings. It has the brown flanks and that pink breast. So because they are finches, they have this huge beak on them that is perfect for picking up seeds. So you normally see them on bramble, thistle, You'll also see them in the dunes looking for small species of thistle. You see them around orchids, that kind of thing. Anything where aphids or small insects can hold on to and hide in, they will eat as well as seeds. So they're particularly enjoying all the thistles that are out at the minute around our dunes. But things like sea holly as well, I've watched them take the heads off the holly and they're just lovely birds. In Welsh, they're called llinos. So a lot of people I know I'm friends with are named Kinos, not knowing that they're actually named after a bird, a linnet. So the females don't have this pink breast. Instead, they have a streakiness to them. Um, a lot of female birds are camouflaged and that's the sexual dimorphism between them. Because of the camouflage and the stripiness when they're nesting in gorse, the females are harder to pick out, whereas the males are very pretty in that they're more appealing as a mate. But of course, these are lovely little birds. They contact call with one another. So you may see a pair or you may see a group of 10 of them, but because they are finches in how they fly, they tend to fly outwards and then wings in, wings out and sort of bounce. And that's just the finch flying style. Lots of bouncing, wings out, wings in, bouncing through the air. And they always call while they're flying. That's because they're flock birds and to keep in touch with their flock, they'll contact call to one another as well. This is a skylark. Skylarks are another species that are 
almost found in every dune system I've ever been at. Uh, Skylarks are very easy to tell apart from pipits. Um, it's once you get your eye into them, but larks are very large birds. Pipits are very small, but if you're looking at the legs as well, larks almost sit bum and belly down, which means you have the legs here, so you normally only see the bottom parts of the legs. Pipits stand very proud and very upright, so you normally see the top parts of the legs and the bottom parts of the legs. But also the beaks are different, skylarks, because their larks have that large beak, and also the crest. So the skylarks do have this crest as well. So there's nothing interesting mainly about how they fly. They do this aerial display, so you normally see them fly into the sky and they sort of shimmy. And that shimmying is them giving out warning signals that you're invading their territory and for you to get out, basically. So they're very easy to spot, mainly because they let themselves be known where they are. Because if you're slightly too close without knowing it, they do this aerial display and give away exactly where they are. So it's quite easy to spot them that way. So this is another species. If you listen to the call, then you'll know for definite what it is. So this is a white throat. So they have um, obviously a white throat, but common white throats, which is what this chap is, has got a gray head. So they have a gray head, which then merges into the brown of the back. Um, lesser white throats like dense the habitat, so you don't often see them on dune systems, but common white throats you will see on dunes because they particularly love shrubs, they love bramble, they love gorse, um, willow, anything like that, white throats will take to it. And once you have a few white throats, then they're just everywhere. This year has been a very, very good year for white throats. We've racked up maybe 50 or 60 of them at Kenfig, and that's without breeding young as well. So once the young come out, there's going to be quite the explosion of white throats everywhere. But they have, because they're sylvia warblers, they're part of the, the sylvia family, they have a very chatty but scratchy sort of singing song. So if you're listening out for them, you'll also hear the variation in tones. So they sing from the throat. So while you're listening to them, it'd be lots of melody and then some scratchy notes and then some nice melody. It almost sounds like they're having a conversation with themselves. So these, again, are a nice species to get your ears tuned in and have a listen to their sound because that will give you a good indication of if you're listening to a white throat. Short-eared owls are another species that use a lot of dune systems. They particularly love voles, mice, and also chicks as well. So they were the bane of my life working with little turns at that spoon because every evening you'd get mesmerized in their hunting style. They just slowly glide through the dunes. It's so pretty to watch but you'd get so focused on watching them you're not noticing that they're flying over your turn colony and you're going to lose some chicks so just watching them their eyes and the shape of their head is adapted for listening so you can see this round shape of the head this is almost like a listening dish so owls have got asymmetrical ears there's instead of having like us we have one each side they have one slightly above the other and that just means they're able to pinpoint sounds a lot easier so when it comes to hunting they know exactly what's making the noise and where that noise is coming from if you've ever watched owls hunt they tend to glide over to where they want and then they just drop because they know exactly where that food is they can also see urine as well so if the mouse has left some tracks they'd be able to see the UV in that as well and they'll drop down exactly where that creature is. So they're amazing hunters and they do use our dune systems just because our dune systems hold so much life on their own. So our predators get a chance to feed off of the dunes just because of how much food is readily available. So of course, if you go into dune systems, it's always really important 
for data collection as well. So there's a lot of apps available, um, not to get things confusing, but I thought it'd be easy for me to run through some of the easiest ones. So you have Bird Track. These are all completely free. Bird Track's free, it's run by the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology. You can record common species on it, you can put breeding species on it, and you can put wintering species on it as well. You can also sign up for different surveys if you'd like to be involved in those kind of stuff. But bird track's a great one. So similar to bird track, there's eBird. So bird track is UK based, eBird is global. I prefer eBird just because um, you don't need to be connected to the internet for it. You can type in where you are, it'll show you on the map where you are. You type in, you don't have to type in species. Bird track, you have to type in the individual species you are seeing. eBird comes up with a list of green species that are commonly seen, amber species and red species. But out of green species, you can just click the plus button. So someone like me, where if I'm counting big flocks of linnets, maybe 40 or 50 birds, I can just click the plus button. I haven't got to worry about manually entering a number and taking my eye off the birds. I can just click the plus. But what I also like about eBird is if I'm visiting a new area, it shows me hotspots of local areas as well. So you can see what people have recorded. And it also gives me a chance to be a little bit nosy and see what people have recorded. And then if I find something different, I know to get in contact with county recorders or locals as well. So bird guides, if you're particularly interested in birds, bird guides um, uploads rare species, scarce species, localized interest in birds. But it's also... Um, a networking thing so there's so many different birds that get uploaded to it for example today we know what's at the dunes just because if there's something new like a cattle egret using the fields next to the dunes then you can go down but you can also submit stuff to it as well so if you're more interested in birds i'd recommend bird guides county recorders as well obviously they have the not envious task at all of collecting all the data from things like bird guides, eBird, bird track, local records. Um, if there's local bird clubs, they have the blogs. So if you find any interest in species or breeding species, you can always just ping your county recorder an email of just what you've seen, just to give their life a bit of ease. And of course, most areas have got records panels as well, where you can send stuff to them. And then if you're ever in doubt of what to send or if something's interesting or if you have an identification one, um, myself and the team are always more than happy to have a look at identification stuff and pass on any messages to anyone else as well. So I'll leave that up just for two seconds in case anybody wants to have a look at any of them. But like I was saying, there's also local bird clubs as well. So they always have a blog. So you can either submit stuff to the blog or if you're keen to get out, there's always free walks, free guided walks in different areas as well. So questions, I believe we had one in the chat. Thanks so much for that, Dan. That was wonderful. I absolutely love the short ear owl. Gosh, absolutely <laughs> stunning. I'd love to see one in, in real life. Yes, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one being, came from Roger when we were talking about harriers. Do predators like harriers have adapted eyes to assist them with spotting prey? He says that he can walk all over the dunes all day and never see anything like a vole or, an owl or a lizard, and they seem to manage it. Um, yeah, so um, predators like harriers, birds of prey, whilst they have very, very good eyesight, they use all of their senses. So they will mainly listen out for things as well. And their eyesight is a lot better than ours. So they haven't got anything particularly interesting about their eyes, but it's just how much they can see. So because of the light color of their irises, it lets in a lot more lights. So when they're hunting at dusk and dawn, they have a lot more light and sight available to them but things like lizards 
I can hear them, but I can never spot them. So you can hear like the scuttering. Gorse is a really good way to spot them just because when gorse petals come, fall off and rot, you can normally hear the scurrying. But yeah, same with me. I've seen, I think this year I've seen two voles on the sand dunes and that was because I accidentally knocked a bush and they came running out. So yeah, they're quite difficult things to spot, but harriers and birds of prey are great at spotting things as well. Okay, and the next question from Alistair, is eBirds, the app that you just mentioned, is that free? Yes, eBirds, completely free. Um, you can sign up and you, you need to make an account basically, but you sign up and you submit checklists. If your friends also use eBird as well, um, you can share a checklist, which I like. I'm all for having an easy life. So if Sam's recording birds, he can share that list with me. So I haven't got to record it as well. So if you're going out in a group or walking group, one of you can do it and then you can share it around with everyone. And it just saves a bit of time. <laughs> Definitely. And how about the uh, the elephant in every room? How is climate change affecting our kind of coastal birds and our, or our seabirds? Uh, seabirds are having a particularly hard time with it. So you may have heard this year, um, Farn Islands, whilst it's not necessarily a dunes, it's a small island off a massive dune system. Um, there's no Arctic turns this year. So normally there's about 20,000 turns. There's none, none at all. And that is just because the weather's gotten so warm. It could just be this year, but the past two years, it's been so hot and humid that the vegetation is just out of control. So whilst we're thinking of things like climate change, that the sea's getting too warm, things like that, we're also seeing our native plants just bloom. Like Ken Fig is completely unrecognizable to what it was in the winter. Everything's just completely... I've never seen so many orchids in all my life walking everywhere. So um, climate change, whilst it's not good for certain species, it's sort of benefiting other species a bit more. Having sort of ecosystems and having birds living together, we're seeing different species thrive because the other ones are no longer there. So something like our oyster catchers and golden plovers, they're doing amazingly because there's less predators taking them and taking the chicks. But then vice versa, we want our predators to do really well, but if our pred predators are doing really well, then some species are gonna suffer due to that. So it's a whole can of worms that is so complicated to look at. Sorry to ask you the big question. <laughs> you have a good answer. Um, we've got another question in. I live on the Sefton coast uh, where there is a stretch of dune heath, which I believe is quite rare. Uh, there's a big patch of dune heath as well on our Studland dunes down in Dorset. But the question is, are there any birds that particularly like a dune heath or dune heather environment? Yeah, so things like your stone chats, they love heather because of all the, um, the spiders that use it. It's a nice easy meal when there's a poor spider that's made a lot of webs between the heads of different heathers, trapped all these aphids and flies, and then the stone chat just comes along and picks them out. So it's species like skylark, stone chat, uh, white throats like heathland, that type of thing as well. Um, your meadow pipits will be particularly interested to them, but you may be lucky to see short-eared owls using them to hunt during the winter just because a lot of mice prefer hair there because they have quite dense roots as well. Brilliant. Okay, and one, one last one from me then. Um, what can we do as coastal visitors and general users of sand dunes and lovers of those environments to make sure that when we're visiting the coast and our dunes, we're not having a negative impact on a lot of our breeding bird species? Yeah, it's quite difficult to... I'm... I find it very awkward, like I love exploring things, but sometimes you walk along and you hear a skylark start alarm calling and you sort of think I stepped somewhere or something's close to me, but basically it's sort of like reading the room. So if you're walking on dunes and you see an already made path that people have walked along to make sure you're following paths, you're not stepping anywhere you shouldn't be because you might be stepping on a bee, nest 
you may be sitting stepping on things like bird nests bird habitats basking areas for adders things like that so it's worth remembering that if there's a path there there's a path for a reason also taking your litter home with you there's so many small creatures that get caught up in these things and then generally it's just about enjoying it you can be miserable everywhere but if you're going to be outside it's not much to be miserable for except for if it rains but yeah absolutely very good advice i'm sure uh, and another question coming as a follow-up to something you've just mentioned do we know where the arctic terns have gone you said that they're not nesting in far the far islands was it where we, we're used to yeah. seeing massive populations where where have they been displaced to or where have they decided to be elsewhere um it's it's a bit of a mystery so they're not there there's some still on the outer farms but it seems like they've just not come this far south again. There's so much vegetation. There's no open area for them to nest in. Um, this COVID has also played a huge part in it in that they've not been able to get machinery over there to sort of reduce a lot of the vegetation. The wardens have particularly struggled. It's a bit isolating at the best of times, but if everyone's isolated and you're isolated, it's, it's a whole debacle. But Hopefully something can be done during the winter now and next year they should return, hopefully. Otherwise, we're seeing that our ones up North Wales, they're still thriving. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some farm ringed Arctic terns amongst our Welsh Arctic terns. Brilliant. Well, that, that's all of the questions. Thank you so much, Dan. That was absolutely fascinating. And thank you to all of you who, who turned up for this. I hope you enjoyed it.